You're listening to The Kelly Track Show. I'm your host, Kelly Track, author, coach, and eternal optimist. Each week, I'll give you lessons to elevate your life, reclaim your personal power, and truly awaken and transform. Your best life starts right now. All right, my friends, welcome back to the show. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, for listening, for joining me every single week for another episode. Holy cow, today you are in for a treat, my friend. We have the divine two souls, Kristen Hange and Natalie Roy, here on the show with us today. I am obsessed with these women, and their podcast is my favorite. And ever since I heard them on Rob Bell's podcast, The Robcast, I was like, OMFG. Who are these divine humans? And they need to come on my podcast stats so my listeners can meet them too. So the day is finally here and they are with us and I am so excited to jump into this episode. Now, if you don't know who Kristen and Natalie are, Natalie Roy is an actress, an author, and a spiritual teacher. She's performed and taught all over the world and on stage and screen. She has her first book, which is called 30 Years, 30 Lessons. She's got her 500-hour yoga teacher training. She's also a meditation teacher specializing in visualization. She also does a lot of positive psychology for actors, and she teaches the yoga sutras, and she takes ancient Eastern philosophy and practices and plays them out into the audition room and onto set. Natalie brings together the practices of meditation and mindfulness and learned optimism with the artistic process and infuses it into her work, especially around the stuff that she does with the Create series. Now, Kristen Hange is passionate about connecting artists with holistic tools to develop and sustain their careers. She is a student and teacher of new thought ancient wisdom traditions, mysticism, and metaphysics. Kristen has studied with internationally renowned spiritual teacher Michael Beckwith, which is kind of a huge deal, (laughs) and is especially interested in how universal laws help us with our creative lives and bring our dharma to the world. She is also best known for directing and developing the smash hit Rock of Ages. So together they co-founded the CREATE series, which stands for Community Reclaiming Every Artist's True Expression. And they lead workshops, retreats, and courses on the act of creation from the spiritual standpoint. And OMG, you are so going to love these two so much. And these women are so divine. And last but not least, support for today's episode comes from my friends at Teachable. If you are also a creative out there and you are looking to get your online course up and running, I'm obsessed with Teachable and the platform. And it's what I personally use for all of my online courses. And if you want to use the link in the show notes to sign up, because you are a divine listener of this podcast, you get access to three free courses on how to build your first class, how to do it, how to nail the marketing, the sound, the lighting. Those have $1,000 in value that you get totally for free. Plus, there's even the option to get eight weeks of free live coaching from the Teachable team as you get your online course off the ground. So if this episode really inspires you to get your creative endeavors going, Teachable is a platform I love and recommend all the time. So the link is in the show notes if you want to get going. And let's just jump right into this super juicy episode. All right. Well, welcome to the show, Kristen and Natalie. I'm so excited to have you guys finally here. Woo! Woo! We should start with an audio clip like you guys always start your audios because I actually love that when you guys have that, when I have the little sound come into my ears. So we're going to all do a a fun sound together. So I love it. Okay, let's do it. One, two, three. Woo! Woo! (laughs) Amazing. So I just wanted to take a quick sec to say thank you because I found you guys on Rob Bell and I remember exactly when I heard your episode with him because I love Rob Bell I mean he's like to die for and his teachings are incredible and I was going through a phase when I was creating one of my courses and I was having such a difficult time in the creation process where it was taking a lot out of me and it was getting kind of emotional and I was hitting this day where things were really uphill and upstream and I remember it was like rainy and like a gross day and here in Vancouver, Canada, and I was on the bus and the bus was late and I was on the bridge and I was listening to you guys talk with Rob Bell and you guys were talking about the process of creation and I could feel my eyes starting to well up in tears. I'm like, oh my God, they get it. (laughs) 
these two women are like my soul sisters and they like understand it. And it was like the most glorious feeling. And this kid, he, I somehow the bus driver missed my stop, but I was like, so on cloud nine by the end of the bus ride from listening to you two. I was like, Oh, that's okay. Like, don't worry. It, it's totally fine. Like bus driver. And this kid that was in my way that wouldn't get off the bus in front of me. I was like, it's all good. Everything's going to work out. It's all going to be great. And I just felt like the most massive shift and you guys just bring so much love and light into the world so I just wanted to say thank you for all that you do up front well thank you I mean I wish you could see us right now we're just we're clutching our chests and looking at each other like proud uh sisters with tears in our eyes so thank you so much that that means so much to us you can't know yeah uh, that's a beautiful reflection Kelly thank you oh you guys are more than welcome I just I love what you do and your podcast is one of my absolute favorites I, every time it comes into my feed I'm like okay okay I gotta listen first so <laughs> Well, if you ever have any feedback for us, if you want more or less singing, whatever, you let us know. <laughs> I love it all. And I love the singing. You two, I just have so much fun on the show. And I always feel the fun. I feel like I'm the third sister in the group. I really feel like even though I'm just listening, listening to you guys, I feel like I'm a part of the, a part of the action, which is always fun. Totally, totally part of the soul tribe. Thank you. So you two are up to the coolest work. So I'd love for you to drop me into each of your days so far and what your morning looked like and what you ate for breakfast. I love that question so much. And Kristen and I had the most fun time talking about because we have very similar days and we often spend most days together, but we also have individual processes. So I actually usually wake up around 3.30 or 4 a.m., and I like to have a little phone chat with someone dear to my heart around that time. And then I'll kind of do just lay in bed, visualization, dreaming about the day, little Abraham Hicks style, you know, thinking about what might be coming or what might be exciting. Usually around 6 a.m. I end up rolling out of bed and I like to set the stage for a beautiful morning practice. So I always do some yoga. Sometimes I do some chanting. I do meditation. I do some reading. I do some journaling, just kind of whatever the day calls for. But usually that's like a real good hour, hour and a half chunk if I really uh, have a lot of time on my hands, which is lovely. And then I go right to my computer and I try to get to some writing and I try to do some creative writing. I'm working on a book right now and I just try to get at least some of that stuff out. And I love to go onto Facebook and post a positive quote and go to the create community page and see what everyone's creating. And then usually around that time, it's about time for a workout. And I usually meet Kristen at steps on Broadway for a dance class. <laughs> And then after Steps on Broadway, we'll go to uh, a little juice press and get a gorgeous green smoothie with almond butter and cinnamon in it, which is usually my delight. Ooh, that's an amazing morning, Natalie. That sounds so fun and nourishing too, really grounding and nourishing. Yeah, and it, you know, it really is a priority. Mornings for me are real sacred time for me. So it's, it's a pretty standard thing unless there's an audition or a travel engagement. There's a pretty, that's pretty much the day. Nice. Yeah. Good job. Thanks. <laughs> Um, and I'm an early riser too. Like I love a lovely 6 a.m. wake up time. Uh, there's something about when the world still feels asleep um, that I think allows you to go in really deep. So I often will wake up and I've been doing this thing that I learned from Aubrey Marcus lately uh, where I'll just do some water with some sea salt and some lemon to hydrate. And then I love to go into a deep journal practice. And I always do, like, I love my coffee in the morning. So I'll do some coffee with a little, like, coconut oil in it. Often my cat will snuggle up to me. And I'll just do a little writing process. And I find that journaling is a lot of how I pray. So I'll, there'll be some sort of gratitude practice and there'll be asking of questions and I'll always be reading something. And I find that there's a real like arc in my morning practice of my journaling where there, there's an asking and there's receiving. And then I always uh, like to sit in silence and I like to finish my morning practice by going to the mirror. Oh, this is my favorite part of your morning practice. I love <laughs> to say affirmative things to myself in the mirror. It's really important for me to like look in my own eyeballs and see my spirit shining back to me. And I'll just say like, 
I'll say whatever I need to hear, but often it's something like, I love you. Mm. I see you and you are beautiful and you are talented and you are sparkling and we're going to have a beautiful day. Um, sometimes I'll say something like, um, <laughs> can I do an impression of you? <laughs> yes. The very first time I ever traveled with Kristen and, and we were just getting to know each other. So it was the first time like staying in an Airbnb together and waking up together and sort of seeing what each other's routine and rhythm was. And Kristen was in the restroom and all of a sudden I heard, good morning, you sexy goddess. <laughs> <laughs> who is she talking to? <laughs> and I turned the corner and naked Kristen living her best life, looking in the mirror, just loving up on herself. And that was when I said, Oh, my self care regimen needs <laughs> to be improved. <laughs> That's awesome. It's my favorite. I love that. Yeah. I love that. I'm going to try that one out tomorrow morning. <laughs> oh, it's so fun to flirt with yourself in the mirror. And uh, and what's really exciting is you're like, oh, the whole world gets to see that all day long. Yeah. You, know, <laughs> you fall in love with yourself in a whole different way. Yeah. And then I do find that throughout the day, when I just recall my own spirit that I see through my eyeballs during the day, mm -hmm. it like gives me a different sense of self. That there's a, almost like there's a purity of your own soul that's undeniable when you look in the mirror. Mm. so being able to hold that with you yeah mm. and and like Natalie I also love to write in the morning like I think you know we both have our own like dharmic projects we're working on um and something that's been really empowering to that process for me is I like to say a prayer out loud so I have like a prayer basically that I say before I sit down to write that I think kind of like it's, it's kind of about opening up the channel and I like to talk to the divine, like a sexy lover who can't wait to delight me with my creativity, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, hey, divine ones out on infinite planes, I can't wait to sit down and let you delight me as you pleasure me with words. <laughs> I think I'll sit down and open up the channel and see what runs through. And I find that the, that way of kind of like priming before I sit down to be creative really, well, kicks my critic out of the way mm -hmm. and it changes my relationship that what is occurring in my creative process is not mine, but something that the universe uh, is doing through me and it's for the delight of me getting to watch it happen. Mm hmm I would also love to add that I started my morning practice probably 10 years ago, and I've been doing it really consistently just because I find for myself that when I get off, it's almost like when you uh, don't take your vitamins and then you get a little bit sick. It's like my spirit doesn't feel good when I don't give myself that time. But my morning practice started at about three minutes. 10 years ago, it was about three minutes was all I could muster. I, I hated meditating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I couldn't sit still. My mind was so busy. And so this really amazing day that we just described and that I feel so blessed that I get to live really was something that I worked my way into finding and creating. So it, even making my morning became a creative act. That was a lot of trial and error and figuring things out and me having to evolve into it. So it's actually just a fun thing to just start wherever you are, whatever your morning is, and just do one little thing to delight yourself and, and see where that leads. And you never know 10 years down the road what it's going to look like. And I think that word delight is really important. Like, can you change it so it doesn't feel like, oh, here's something I have to do, like yeah. push-ups. Like you know homework. what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. can, it, can it be... Um, romantic can yeah sensual yeah I love that I love how you guys bring in this sensual aspect of creation and this pleasurable side and seeing it in that sense of sort of like you know dancing with the muse and expressing yourself like how you would with a lover versus being like okay dream show up like this do it like this give me this much money and just the totally different dynamics and I've that's something I've really loved learning from you too is the importance of like pleasure and play and fun. And I also wanted to ask before we dive in, when you two both had your aha moment that you guys were also supposed to be spiritual teachers. Oh, oh 
Oh, well, oh. Kristen had it on my behalf long before <laughs> I. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll, I'll just say you know mine is really funny. I was actually in a developmental production of Rock of Ages in like 2007, uh, literally doing a number where it was like all these girls. <laughs> like literally like in thongs and fishnets Fish <laughs> was enough it, we're doing it any way you want it where like men are like roping and grabbing them swear to goodness this is my moment of satori so it's just like very like sexual 80s number and i'm in rehearsal and i have like my i remember having my hand on my hip and like a god mic which is like a big mic that everyone in the theater can hear but it was off so no one could hear it but i looked over at my musical director and i remember going I think I want to be a spiritual teacher. <laughs> um, but, but, but what happened prior to that was, um, you know, through directing and writing, I ended up teaching. And um, I love to work with other creatives and help them open up their creative channels. And what I realized as I was teaching, like, you know, this started in my, my late 20s, was that I really love to talk about metaphysical tools in the process of creation. So I kind of um, thought I was talking about right, p- talking to people about their writing, but we were actually talking about spirituality because creativity and spirituality is the same freaking thing. Um, so it, so I kind of found myself accidentally as a spiritual teacher. And then I think that moment when I was standing there in Rock of Ages as I had been doing it for a few years by then and was like, I, I think I'm ready to come out of the closet and just be, be like, this is something that I do. And then in terms of Natalie, <laughs> I, I want to say I accosted her and pinned her down and I was like, no, oh, by the way. <laughs> You're playing with me. You're playing with me. <laughs> um, I kept hearing in my meditation that Natalie and I were supposed to teach together. Yeah. Yeah. And then she asked me out for lunch one day and said, was asking me all these personal questions about myself and my relationship to divine and and what I do with my life and what I love. And I was like, is this a date? (laughs) (laughs) Because Kristen's a fancy director and I'm an actor. Should I have brought my resume? What is this? I don't know what's happening. Um, And so in the end, she said, you know, I've been hearing in my meditation that I'm going to move to New York and we're supposed to teach together. And I said, teach what? <laughs> I had no idea. And she said, well, why don't I just send you what I've been doing? And then you send me what you've been doing and we'll just see what we have. Now, in the meantime, I had been living in Toronto, Canada. I'm from New Brunswick, Canada. And I was uh, an actress in Toronto, but really I'd had this really awesome career. And then all of a sudden I had this real like low point where it was like, I couldn't book a job to save my life all of the sudden out of nowhere. And so I got into that real kind of desperate, depressed, nothing's ever going to change. Nothing ever works. Uh, You know, I, I feel like I need something more. I ended up moving to Los Angeles just completely on a whim with nothing in my head other than maybe I'll be happier if I just sit on a beach and ride horses for a few months. And I ended up walking into a yoga studio. I had never done yoga a day in my life. I walked into the yoga studio, this beautiful Southern woman named Christy Marsden, who's one of my best friends and gurus and teachers, and we've had her on our podcast. I walked into her yoga studio. She says, hi, y'all, come on in. And it was so welcoming and lovely that I thought, well, whatever she's on, that's probably would make me feel better. And I didn't do a single pose in her class. I just laid on my mat and cried and cried. There was something about that atmosphere, the yogic world that I had previously judged and thought was really like phony and for hippies and people who drank green juices. Mm -hmm. Uh, Now I'm one of those people who drinks green juices. But I remember feeling so moved by whatever that energy she had and whatever that teaching was because she wasn't just talking about yoga poses she was talking about spirituality she was talking about feelings she was talking about the meaning of life freedom from suffering she was talking about things I really wanted to know about I left that yoga class and I signed up for her yoga teacher training I signed up knowing I wasn't here to be a yoga teacher but I knew that there was something there for me I ended up staying in LA for almost a year and a half and doing tremendous amounts of training in meditation therapy. And, uh, I did over time a 500 hour teacher training and learned a lot about positive psychology and learned all of these tools and then thought, Oh, it's my job to merge my two worlds together and bring these holistic tools back to artists, back to actors, back to creators. 
So I was specifically teaching on the chakra system and Eastern philosophies and the sutras of yoga, which are just beautiful texts that tell you how to live a life that is really free of suffering and attachment. And I was using it to apply to my artistic life. And all of a sudden I was having a really great career again. I was happy again. I just felt so transformed. I wanted to give these tools away. So when Kristen and I shared our information, we realized we were teaching exactly the same tools from totally different mediums. So the East meets the West. It was almost word for word the same curriculum, just from two totally different lenses. So we knew we were brought together to bring these tools together. We didn't know at the time we would also become best friends. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe. Maybe we did. Maybe we did. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love your guys' story of how you two came together and how this was created and formed and it's so f funny how you know when the universe wants you to get the message the universe really does give you the message and yeah i just so appreciate you sharing that's the podcast we just did when the universe wants to give, give you, you a, a message, message. <laughs> we literally just recorded <laughs> right before we talked to you see kelly you are our sister <laughs> there we go oh thank you thank you so i want to talk to you guys about pleasure and i want okay yes <laughs> this is to. oh if we have to i would like to begin by starting off about your Two's definition of the phrase "life is for motherfucking joy," which I love. <laughs> life is for, for motherfucking joy. joy. Uh, we also have a music video you can watch. Oh, I've already watched it. It's so good. <laughs> um. So, so this is so you know one of the things that I think that Nat has emerged as Natalie and I have taught is the importance of fun and play in our lives and in our creative process. You know, that there's this kind of story of like hard and making things happen that actually get us out of the flow of spirit, right? So when we clamp down and when we try to control, we're actually cutting ourselves off from universal energy and play and pleasure and fun and joy opens up the channel and gets us in the flow. So we're always encouraging people to do whatever they need to do to get them in that childlike wondrous state. And we were teaching a class of the divine feminine <laughs> in Los Angeles. And one of the students in the class, this wonderful artist uh, named Charlie Flight wrote a poem. And in this poem, she like wrote three times in a row, life is for joy. Life, life is, is for joy. joy life is for joy and then we were lit on fire like a, we were lit like a christmas tree we were like yeah life is for joy, joy. oh my god and and then it became uh, something funny where natalie and i would like uh, yell at each other when we were like in a triggered state so like say uh you know like I, there was an audition i really wanted and i didn't get it and i would call Kristen and say life is for joy <laughs> like oh, have a way to remind ourselves like i'm not gonna take this too seriously right now i know the point of existence is playing i'm gonna like i, I i'm making fun of myself almost uh -huh. in my annoyed state and then as we would have like our dance classes and our workouts and our smoothies somehow it turned into life is for motherfucking joy well, because we started <laughs> deciding we were gonna make it a song uh -huh. So it's, it started as, um, life is for joy, and we would just yell it. And then, well, we started a song that we never published called Smoothie of My Dreams. <laughs> yes, we have a Smoothie of My Dream Soul. <laughs> which, which is about how delicious our smoothies were. And then after that song emerged, very quickly, life is for motherfucking joy. And so we would just sing that to each other just for fun. Walking down the street. Walking down the street, just being silly. And then one day I went to Kristen's house to record a podcast and she was there with our two best friends uh, Scotty and John and they said oh by the way Scotty and I wrote the life is for motherfucking joy song and we're all gonna learn it and video it and record it and we were like what could be more fun than this this is what's happening today <laughs> Yeah, so that that's that is that is the evolution of life is for motherfucking joy. But it is becomes this kind of like mantra so that we don't misplace our priorities. Mm. Right? That if we keep remembering that the point of existence is in is to be in a childlike playground, it changes the dynamic of how we interact with everything in our world. And we were many of us were raised in households that 
said, you know, do your homework first and then you can play. Eat your dinner first and then have mm -hmm. dessert. And, you know, th these lessons are obviously important in that form. Yes. But then we take that form and we end up making it sort of some universal law that applies to everything. And then we go through our life thinking, well, only once the hard work is done can I have enjoyment, can I have pleasure. Only on the weekend mm -hmm. can I have fun and let loose or laugh or have joy. And so what it became for us was an experiment of what would happen if we put joy and pleasure first. What would happen if we said the first thing we're going to do every day is have fun and be in joy and be in pleasure and then after we do that we'll let ourselves do a little bit of work. Mm -hmm. Even if what we're doing for joy is just a two minute dance party. Mm -hmm. Even if it's something that doesn't take a lot of time. Can we just take a contrary action in terms of even just the order that we're doing it and then see if life shows up for us differently even just by changing that one thing. And of course what Kristen and I found is the experiment was so much fun and it opened so many doors, conversations, opportunities, it opened us up. We were finding joy and fun and pleasure everywhere. We were meeting strangers, traveling in countries and having joyous experiences. And it just became something that we couldn't not stand for. That's right. And there's this quote that I love that says, work is love made visible. Mm. So, so even what we want to call work is really supposed to be an expression of love. And I just think that in our conditioning sometimes, we have stripped the love and the fun and the play right out of things. And it's harmful for us. I actually think um, it's not the way we were, we were meant to interact on this planet. Yeah, I'm, I'm so with you on that one, this idea of enjoying the pleasure first and the concept of alignment before actions and, you know, getting into that high vibration place and then just seeing what else is left with the energy to create. Can you share a little bit about how the joy and the pleasure and the love and the fun really speeds up the manifestation process with our dreams versus how we like mentally think, oh, if I just try harder, it will eventually come. Well, one thing that uh, I think Kristen said it at one point and we just kept it and ran with it is fun is the fast track to your dreams. Mm, I love that. And we have just everything that we sort of teach, we take on in our own lives as completely an experiment because we just want to be in a curious relationship with life. Almost like we're looking at life like this amazing, fun place playground that we get to go play in and we just want to see what's out there we don't want to know everything we want to be curious about what we don't know so we started saying well what would happen if we activated fun if we activated joy what became really interesting was even in the way Kristen and I found each other I just had this love I had this beautiful dear great aunt Alice who had all these quote books and she always every day wrote these quotes in her little books and I remember when she passed seeing these books and all of these quotes and thinking I knew so much about her by these quotes that she loved. And I started this practice of every day on Facebook, just posting a quote. It didn't even necessarily have to do with what was going on in my life. It just, it brought me joy. It made me think about something in a different way. It was like, let me put something positive out there. This just feels good. And actually that was kind of how Kristen got to know me was through my quotes on my Facebook page. So it's this thing of when we put action out from the vibration and the energy of joy and play and pleasure, we are going to attract other people that are in that same kind of vibrational agreement with us. So then what we are going to attract is not people who are going to disagree with us or, or patronize us or not want to be team players. We're going to actually attract collaborators who are going to say, oh yeah, I'm game to make that. Oh yeah, yeah, no, we'll find the money for that. And so then all of a sudden the creative process becomes so much easier because you have a whole bunch of people that are more concerned with solution and joy and enjoying the process than creating some sort of or executing some sort of results. I like to think of it as like everything that we do is infused with the energy with which we create it. I think Marianne Williamson said that and I can't stop saying it since I've read it. So if we think of it as whatever it is that we're making or creating is going to be jam packed with what we brought to it. So knowing that energy is magnetic and it's attractive, that if we come to it 
in the ultimate states of love, joy, energy, inspiration, man, that thing's going to be like the bi biggest magnet you've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have to go out and like hustle and promote and try to get people to get our thing that whatever it is that we're creating is going to have its own momentum. And I just think it's more fun to create something that has so much energy. It's going so fast that people are just running to catch up to it. Mm. Mm. Oh, that is so beautifully said. I love that. That reminds me of one of the quotes I've been really thinking about a lot is from Nikola Tesla. And he said, if you want the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, which gets me so excited. Yeah. And, and, you know, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who does a lot of mm -hmm. work, the sort of biology of belief and, uh, and sort of like w what makes us who we are. He has this great book called breaking the habit of being yourself. And he talks about how everything we do, we, as the observer always change what we are observing, you know, and everything is energy and matter. And he talks about how we have this power that whatever vibration and energy we infuse with what we do will actually change the thing that we're creating. Mm. So it's almost like all of us want to create an award winning script or we want to create a podcast that has tons of listeners. But if we are filling that offering with our own doubt and our own worries and our own fears, then vibrationally, energetically, people aren't going to want to be connected to that. Right. So we always want to be mindful of the energy that we bring into the room, into the energy that we bring into what we create. And we know that we can change it in a heartbeat as soon as we bring our consciousness to it. Mm, yes, I love that. And how would you define consciousness for the listeners in your in your own words? Well, I think that for me, I like to think of it in the yogic model, which is that we are in a dualistic universe in the same way Einstein described the universe as both matter and energy, as both form, things like tables and chairs and bears and elephants and human bodies and tissues and muscles. And also there is energy that can't be created or destroyed. And the yogis call this the, the formless, the unmanifest. It's called purusha. It's kind of thought of as a light inside of us, consciousness, the seed of the soul. It's that which cannot change. It cannot die. It's the thing that when you were two years old or five years old or 10 years old was inside of your changing body. And even though everything in your life, your friends, your school, your body, everything was changing changing, there's something in you that has been the same the whole time that is watching this form the whole time. So in this dualistic universe, and the, the philosophy of yoga is called Samkhya philosophy, and it says you can think of Purusha as your individual consciousness, or you can think of it as individual and universal consciousness, like something like a god or a higher power or universe. Or you can think of it as a tree or love or whatever you want. You can call it whatever you want. It's, it's not uh, that you have to believe in a higher power in order to believe in your own consciousness. You can either believe that it's connected to a higher consciousness or you can believe that your consciousness is the higher consciousness. But that in this dualistic reality, we are both things. We are this conscious witness that's watching this whole thing go down. And we are the vehicle, the vessel that our consciousness gets to use to play with life, to experience life. And so what the yogis say is that everything that is in form is put in front of us or with us or in relationship with us so that we can know ourselves as consciousness so that everything that happens to us is just meant to bring us closer to knowing our authentic self, which is a conscious energy that nothing bad can really happen to. Mm, I love that. That was so well explained, Natalie. That was so perfect. So on this topic of working with the higher power and the unseen forces and all of your consciousness and universal intelligence, I would love for you to, to share about your phrase of how is not our business and why is not our job. Can you deep dive on this? Yes. I think it started as just part of it. It started as uh, how is not my job, uh -huh. right? Mm -hmm. So when we were first uh, teaching how is not my job, 
was everything that we would would talk about. So <laughs> often, you know, with creators and with all of us being creators, you get a vision. You get a vision of something you want to create in your life. And the next question everyone wants to answer is how. <laughs> we like to go. Eh, 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 eh. That's, that's not your job. Your job. Your job is show me the first step because that's all you're ever going to get is that first step. You'll get the end result, right? And you'll, and you'll get the very next step. And it might be a very simple step. And it might be a step you don't want to take. <laughs> right. And then the job is to show up and take that step. And you're not going to get the next one until you take that step that's right in front of you. So it's a, it's, it's a progress of unfoldment on the way to that vision. The other thing, and I think it was first on the rock cast. I think so. Came I, think, out I, the, I think it was like an improv. Yeah. Of, <laughs> of um, uh, how is not our job and why is why it is not our, our business. business. Yeah. But one of the things that comes up all the time to talking uh, with cre- creatives and artists, uh, the way that the uh, inner critic can express itself is through, well, why should I do this? Who cares if I ever make anything? Why me? Why me? I, I'm not smart enough. Like all, all of these, no one doesn't care if I write a book or if I make a song. So if we take both of those off the table, the ego has very little ammunition. And what we like to say is that the why is already answered. If you have the dream inside of you, then the why is already answered mm-hmm. because it's for you. Yeah. So... If you come up with the idea of, oh, there's this cookbook I really want to create. Well, then you just take the one next step. Well, well, how am I going to get it out there? Well, how am I going to get people to read it? None of that's your job. Just just do the one next thing. Start writing down recipes. Well, then if you start saying, "Well, well, why is this coming through me? Why would I be better at writing this than some master chef? The why has already been answered because you're the one who received the idea. The idea is always received by the vessel that it is best brought through. Mm, I love that. I love that other phrase that you two had shared about how the universe wouldn't have given us the dream if we weren't able to handle it or fulfill it or take it on. That concept is so gorgeous and so empowering, especially in the moments when you're like, oh my God, I can't take this on or holy shit, this is too big for me. Yeah. Well, and also it, it's not going to give us the dream or the vision if it's also not going to give us all of the resources to fulfill that vision. So with the idea also, and, and always in the moment that we need it, the universe is going to give us what we need. So often, like I know someone right now who has this incredible business idea for organic farming, but they're like, well, I need the money to show up before I could ever, you know, take on how big my vision is. And if we always put this idea that the resources need to be there before we start, the resources, the resources are never going to show up. So how we, it's almost like we are these beautiful, like sorceresses and sorcerers that through our belief in that vision and taking one committed action, one after the other, cause the resources to come towards us. Right. So if you take the one step you have in front of you, you'll start to see how that action alone opens up doors and the next thing you need, the next person, the next, um, five dollars, five dollars shows up, Yeah, you know, and, and little by little you get there. Mm -hmm. The tiny, the tiny steps and the small actions, because we always want to see like, okay, how can I make this happen? And like, what is my 10 year plan? And what is my next year going to look like? And I mean, you can sit and plan the year all you want. And then by the end of the year, you're like, I got a totally different year than anything I could have ever predicted. And sometimes just that trust in knowing that whatever the universe can create for you is just far better and bigger than what anything you can create with your like tiny little human mind. And I just love that. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like uh, the universe or our own consciousness is always looking at us being like, look at that cute little muffin with their cute little notebook and their cute little (laughs) hands that are never going (laughs) to (laughs) happen. Totally. We get upset at ourselves because we look at all these plans. Like I wrote down my goals and and they they didn't have it. (laughs) Yeah. But I think sometimes we miss is that it doesn't necessarily look like the way our ego is going to make it look. I was talking to this other director the other day. We were having like dinner and we were laughing about like, 
sometimes it looks like you have this amazing year filled with all of these projects and just watch they then all of a sudden they all just like disappear for different reasons and then all of a sudden it can look like you have a total open barren landscape and then all of a sudden all these things drop in and you have the most busy schedule so planning becomes impossible so that kind of um it's it's, it's like life saying um hey baby i got you how about you trust this moment? How about you open to this next thing? How about you listen to your heart a little deeper? Mm, I love that. That is so beautiful, Kristen. I think that's such a, a beautiful way to also just practice that trust to, to lean in in those moments when you feel like you can't control anything. Like you had shared about the schedule of like, oh, everything's in the schedule and nothing's in the schedule. Then it's wide open and then everything floods in and just that concept of like opening opening your heart I love that that little visual that I got really landed for me right on time so thank you I'm gonna thank you for that one <laughs> the idea that thank goodness none of that is mine to control yeah. and the thing that is mine to control is how much fun I'm having and how much pleasure I'm, I'm letting myself have and how much desire I'm tapped into it's like wow everyone in this process has a job and the universe or consciousness is going to be the CEO that's going to run the business and do the spreadsheet and hire the people and do the things. And I get to just be on paid vacation and then <laughs> complaining. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I love just, that. I'm the best job over here. Wait, by the way, can I just say right now, paid vacation is a wonderful podcast topic. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think that's such a great way to visualize it too, to know that it's, it's not you. Like it's, the universe is giving the dream to you and you are the vehicle, but it's not all up to you. And you do not have to put your hands in the sand and build the whole castle by yourself. Like there's help. It's like, you know, it's like you have the whole show and there's butlers and you've got a team and you've got unseen invisible hands at play. And just that is something I've been so leaning into and strengthening and developing because yes, I so agree with what you two had shared at the beginning of the episode around how creation is spirituality the two go together like I didn't even know I was a spiritual person until I started my business and then I was like oh shit <laughs> wow I am a spiritual person like look at all these things I had to learn and practice <laughs> and it's yeah, so true Rob Bell says that everything is spiritual yes everything 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 is leading us back to knowing ourselves as spirit as Purusha mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and also on the topic of this creative process can you two share more about core wounds and why the universe will bring up all of our personal difficulties and wounds and hardships when we are going through this process of creation? Well, I so so the yogis describe core wounds as uh, samskaras. And I, samskaras is like a fun word because it feels like a scar on your body, right? And, uh, you know, Michael, uh, Michael Singer talks a lot about when we have this uh, thorn or this wound in our skin. And oftentimes what we will do is then say, okay, well, every time something brushes up against this thorn, this wound in my body, it really, really hurts. So let me put a big giant bandage around it so nothing touches it. Oh, well, things are still touching it. Okay, well, let me build a contraption around it so nothing can touch it. Okay, well, now I can't get into certain doorways. Okay, well, now I'm going to live in places that only have these kind of doorways. Okay, well, then that means that I'm only hanging out with certain people who live in these certain places, and then I'm going to marry someone who lives in that place, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He tells the story much better, but it ends up being that this wound that you're trying to make sure that nothing ever touches, that you're so busy protecting, is actually the thing that's running your whole life and making every decision on your behalf. So everything that happens to you is actually not a result of your free will or your creative choice. It's you trying to protect yourself from ever feeling these wounds. Now, all of us come into life as these innocent, perfect little babies. And it's not that anyone did anything wrong to us. It's that the whole point of life is to experience contrast of our perfection, to experience all the things that life has to offer. Otherwise, we wouldn't bother they're incarnating here. So the point is for us to get into pain and have our hearts broken and have all of these things happen so that we can learn who we are, learn how we process and understand life and understand the meaning of reality and consciousness. The mistake many of us make is when we feel these core wounds, these sacred 
pains come up that are these deep ancient pains from from childhood these these can be pains like the fear of abandonment or scarcity or loss and when these things come up oftentimes we want to say i don't want to feel that i want to push that down i want to protect myself against it what we know is that the creative process is designed to let us touch them to let us go all the way into them because oftentimes uh, creation is about moving through and being in harmony in a different relationship with it instead of hiding ourselves away from it. So it's not that once you start living your creativity or living your spiritual life that you must be doing something wrong because now all the wounds are coming up. It's almost like as it's coming up, it's coming up so that we can uh, heal and understand ourselves. So it's almost like that's the, the message where we say, oh, I'm really on the right track here. That's right. If you can you think of it this way, the universe just wants us to know how powerful and unlimited we are. It wants to clear up misperceptions of where we have limited ourselves or inherited limited stories. So it's a very, that the process itself is a loving process. It may feel uncomfortable because we're, we're having to release these false ideas. And I love when uh, Marianne, Williamson's, Marianne, Marianne Williamson will talk about love brings up anything unlike itself. So when you fall in love with someone, everything that is unlike love will come up to be healed in that process. And the same thing is true in creativity. So in a creative process, which is love in action, right? Work is love made visible. So here is love in process. It's going to bring up those places that we have, that are like dark corners of our psyche so that they can come up into the light and be transformed. Mm, I love that. That is so beautiful. And this concept of feeling whole along the journey, especially when there can be so much uncertainty and so much that can feel like it's at stake and that everything's going wrong and like shit's really hitting the fan to know that that is a sign that we are on the path, that we are doing it right. I love that. And I love that you two sh shared that idea. And that's where I first realized like, oh, maybe I am doing some of this right if part of it is going wrong or part of it's bringing up this hard stuff. And they are just really reminds me of that day when I was on the bus and I was having the most difficult time and having that knowingness that, oh, everything is going to work out. So thank you for that. Well, you know, it's funny, Kelly, because I think that a lot of people, they hit those moments on the bus that feel hard and feel challenging and, and they come up against these, uh, what feel like obstacles and, they go, oh, this means I'm supposed to stop, or this means I'm supposed to go back, or this means I'm supposed to give up this dream. I took a wrong turn. Right. There's something wrong here as opposed to there's something really right here. Mm, yes, that's such a, a good point, that idea of it being, like leaning into the fact that, okay, what is the good that I could see versus, you know, like throwing in the towel and quitting. That's such a, a good moment to reflect and just check in and and think because I I mean for me this stuff has been totally a learned practice like I think in the past I would have definitely been like well I'm not good at this like quit like end I, I want I only want to do things that I was good at when I was younger if it was difficult or a challenge I would I'd be, oh that's not for me but yeah I love that you shared that and thank you for that it makes me feel very empowered knowing that I am progressing on my spiritual journey and my path and that I'm getting better at this stuff one day at a time <laughs> You know that you're in your ego because the ego only wants to play games. It knows it can win. Yeah, totally. So you know when you're willing to throw yourself in the arena and go, I have no idea. I'm totally going to fall flat on my face here. Then you know that you're in the creative process. Mm, yes, that is so beautiful and so well said. So this is a perfect spot for us to start wrapping up. So I just have a final quick couple of questions before you two leave. So what would you two say to someone who's like brand spank new and just starting out on this journey of creation? Well, here's what I would say. How cute that you think that you're new at this because you've been doing this since the very first breath you took on this planet. <laughs> that mm. you are actually a creative being and every thought that you have had up until this point, every feeling you have had, every action you have taken has been a manifestation. Every time you think, I wonder what I want to eat for lunch today, and you see it in your head, and then you make it happen, that's a visualization turned into manifestation. That's an inspiration into manifestation, which is a creative process. So 
what we know is that you're a creator, whether you believe you're one or not. But if you believe that you're one, then you can create consciously and empower yourself to create what you want rather than just feel like you're reacting to some creation outside of you. Mm, yes, that's so good. Permission. Mm. I would say if you are looking for permission, here it is. <laughs> you have permission. Go for it. Yeah. Many times we look out into the world for some sort of permission slip or for validation. Uh, Natalie knows I work with a lot of different writers who will sometimes just call me because they want to hear my voice to say, keep going, right? So I think we all need someone in our life that can just say, you got this, keep going. You, you are worthy. You are whole. Yes, you should be doing this. Here's all the permission in the world to do it the way you want to do it, the way it feels good to you. This is your life. This is your work of art. Now go. And then the second thing I would say after full permission and worthiness has been given is carve out time for silence that the biggest tool that will help us on our path is our ability to sit still and listen to our own inner voice. We want to get to that place where we're listening to our own interior voice more than we're listening to the voice of the world. And, and that comes, I think, through a commitment of learning how to listen to oneself. And sometimes with listening, it can be really tricky because you can feel like, for example, with meditation, well, my mind is so busy, it won't shut up. So it actually feels more stressful to try to quiet my mind. You don't have to try to quiet your mind. You just have to show up and, and just, you know, the yogis say, if you could breathe three breaths in a row with maintaining one single focus, then you will have the secret of life because it's really hard to even just breathe three breaths with one focus. So think of your mind as a ceiling fan that's spinning around really fast. And when you sit down to meditation, you're not just expecting the ceiling fan to just all of a sudden stop moving, but you turn the light off and then over time, it'll get a little slower and a little slower. And one little piece of inspiration might sneak in amid all of that noise and chaos. So you don't have to worry about all those thoughts going around. You don't have to control them or try to stop them. You can just sit and watch. You can go, wow, my mind's busy. Wow, look at all that chaos going on. Wow, look at how it's creating a story that I'm really bad at this. And then underneath that, there might be one little nugget. And that's worth sitting for listening. Mm, yes, that's so beautiful. And that's funny that you share that because I was literally recording a podcast episode this morning about the importance of creating space and stillness. So we're clearly all on the same podcast topic <laughs> wave. <laughs> so what is your favorite place for listeners to connect online and say hi? Oh, well, we would love if you would come to our Create Community Facebook page. Uh, we're on there every day. We post quotes, uh, and the community is amazing, and it's from people all around the world who are in the creative process in totally different ways, and so it's really fun to connect and hear how people are, are creating and what what's inspiring and just share your story. So that's a really fun place to be. We also would love it if you came to our website, which is www.thecreateseries.com. And uh, if you come there, you can join our mailing list and you're going to get a free download that's going to help you build a morning practice that's designed by us. So that's just a free gift to you for joining our mailing list. And then you can get our monthly newsletter, which will tell you uh, how you can come see us teaching live. You can hear about our retreats that we do. We do this really fun thing called pleasure around the world, where we go to these amazing cities and teach on pleasure and desire and have food and wine and fun and dancing. And it's a really good time. The next one is in Italy. We're going to Rome at the end of August into September. And we do have some spaces left. So if you're interested in that, you can go to our uh, create Facebook page or pleasure around the world.com. And you can find out more about that. Um, and also on Instagram, we're at the create play group on Instagram, or I'm uh, miss Natalie Roy on Instagram, or you can get Kristen at hangy love on Instagram. And we're on there uh, pretty often. And we love to hear from you. And we love seeing all the art and everything that's going on there. There. Yeah, if you want to stalk us and see how cute we are, <laughs> our outfits, Instagram is really the place to be. Mm -hmm. um, if you want like fun spiritual tools or to like hang deep with us, you can come to our website at www.thecreateseries.com and we have the best 
podcast, or at least we think <laughs> it is because it's us talking, so take that with a grain of salt, but it's called Let's Play the Create Podcast, um, and you can find it on iTunes or on Simplecast, and, um, you know, we love, we love to hear what people are out there doing and what's in your heart to make. Perfect. And we do have this fun little thing where we love to travel. So if you want us to come like to your town yeah. and teach a workshop, we'll totally do it. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Hit us up. Um, uh, that just happened. Uh, we had a listener reach out to us and said, I want you to come to Denver. And we made it happen. Yeah. So um, do not do not hesitate. be shy. Just know that uh, fortune comes to those who are bold. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I love that. I'll be sure to put all the links in the show notes. And your two retreats, oh my gosh, they sound divine. Like pleasure in Paris. I love listening to the, the bits about how, your descriptions of them. They were just making me so happy on my walks. And pleasure oh. in Italy. Oh my goodness. Behind the scenes story too. There was a lot of fun and joy and desire in Paris. <laughs> Woo! Woo! I can only imagine. Can't wait to see what happens in Italy. Oh yes. And the last question is what can the listeners and I personally do to support you? Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Thank you for that. Will you send us good energy? Yes. Just All of the good love and energy. Send us positive flow. And honestly, we do love to hear from people. So even just like getting an email through our website that says, hey, you're making a difference. It's it's a really deep and wonderful process. Yeah. And even on our podcast, if you listen and enjoy it and you want to go over and give a little review, it just helps other people who are on the same path. And the more of us having this conversation, the better, you know, because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. And we need each other, you know, create our company stands for community reclaiming every artist's true expression. And we believe everyone's an artist and we believe that we're all going to rise together. Together. So we we want all of us on the same team. It's a, it's a team sport. Team sport. <laughs> totally. It totally is. Well, thank you so much, Kirsten and Natalie. This was such a treat and a pleasure for me to chat with you guys today. And I so loved what you shared. It was such, such, such a pleasure. So thank you so much. Well, we adore you. We adore what you're creating on the planet. We're so honored to have connected with you, our Soul Tribe sister, and we can't wait to support you in everything that you're doing. And uh, just thank you for your gifts as well. Aw, thank you. All right, my friends, and there you have it. That is the show for you today. Holy cow, I know, right? These two women are so amazing. I so adored listening to this episode myself like I've spent so many hours listening to their show so the fact that they were on mine like just kind of blows my mind a bit sometimes <laughs> anyways I love their teachings and if you found this podcast episode so valuable and so helpful and you had a huge aha moment take a second to share it take a screenshot on your phone upload it to your Instagram stories tag us in it tag at hangy love at Miss Natalie Roy and at Kelly Track, I would so love to see what you got out of this and what your big takeaway was. So my friends, thank you so much for being here. Thank you as always for listening, for downloading, for tuning in. And I'm so excited to see your beautiful shares over on Instagram. And thank you so much as always for being here. Bye. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening today. If you love this episode, please take a second to share it with somebody that you know needs to hear this message. And if you feel so called and so moved, please write an honest review of what you think about this podcast in iTunes and leave me some stars. That would truly help me out on my journey to helping millions and millions of people. And until next time, have a lovely day and I'm so excited to see you back here soon. <laughs>